today in the lecture we'll talk about the imperial ideologies as we are doing a series on history of india from 1750s to 1857 and in this context imperial ideologies or the various kind of ideologies which were propagated by the british how they tried to use those ideologies in the context of india how they tried to bring certain laws with regard keeping in mind those ideologies and how these ideologies they were being used in a way to rule india this is what we are going to discuss uh, in the course of our discussion if you want to see certain readings which can be referred for this is thomas metcalf's ideologies of the raj shekhar bandopadhyay's book ncrt and igno material all this uh, you can refer some of uh, all these readings especially thomas metcalf's ideologies of the raj provides a uh, comprehensive view of the various kinds of ideologies which were being used by the british for their own ends so when you tend to understand these ideologies what was the basis of using these kind of ideologies the kind of intellectual currents which were there in britain and how uh, uh, in a way suppression of certain people or certain regions will benefit british so they were the basis uh, for their uh, they were the basis for these kind of ideologies and these all these ideologies they were being used uh, for their self interest if you see uh, in the garb of ideologies for various kinds of interest that was being used and british had this kind of uh, sense of superiority where they, con they considered themselves to be the most superior the ideas of racialism greed uh, their, their mentality various kind of interest with which uh, uh, british were associated the ideas of deceit and treachery they were all there in the garb of ideology so british uh, they were in a way trying to convey this kind of a thing that when they were superior uh, to the people those who were inferior to them so these people they were either colored in nature the people from asia and africa and british uh, the idea of the white race later which was in a way communicated by rudyard kipling as well when he talks about the white man's burden that how a white man has this kind of a burden to civilize the natives and these natives they were there in africa as well as in asia and uh, in the name of uh, getting them civilized they were being in a way exploited by the british for their own personal ends and uh, we see that this uh, policy of racialism was always in the favor of the white race and later histories they were also written from the perspective of eurocentrism where uh, the idea of europe as the center of the universe was propagated so ideologies were in a way various kind of ideologies like orientalism or utilitarianism evangelicalism all these ideologies were used by the british for their own ends if you see the irish background then we will come to know that with the people of ireland british they considered themselves to be more superior in nature and irish people they were considered to be inferior in nature that they were in a way uncivilized they were not uh, civilized they were barbarous in nature and british they uh, suggested that uh, they will in a way subdue ireland in that way and uh, at, uh, and from the ideological point of view they will communicate uh, to the irish people uh, that british were more civil in nature and on the other hand irish they will uh, be seen as barbarians and uncivil and british will use all these kind of ideas for uh, setting up uh, their own plantations so that was the kind of idea uh, which was propagated by the british and uh, irish people they were initially used by the british uh, to propagate these kind of ideas and thereafter we also see that sir thomas smith he talked about uh, the english responsibility that how they have to inhabit and reform this barbarous nation so the conquest of ireland was in the framework of that how british uh, they became the new romans and these romans they had to civilize the backward people as the romans did in the earlier times and this rationale if you tend to see this rationale was uh, not only there with regard to ireland but it was extended to the people in in africa asia especially india if you see so these were the kind of things british uh, which were employed by the british for their for for their own uh, uh, self aggrandizement and at the same time for the self promotion another aspect which was also associated was in the context of the idea of patriotism and the britishness that certain 
traits or ideas they were being promoted that these were the british traits these were the british ideas and whosoever a person a british was he will have these kind of ideas so british considered themselves to be the just rulers and they will communicate that uh, whatever kind of despotism which was there in india was some sort of an oriental despotism and uh, on the other hand kind of despotism which was there in europe was enlightened in nature and say the so they referred their uh, despotism as enlightened despotism so these were the kind of ideas which were propagated uh, by the british where they tried to communicate themselves as modern and civilized people and when you tend to suggest yourself as progressive modern enlightened then you have to show that other people are in a way savage or they are vicious they are backward in nature so this these kind of uh, ideas they were central to the enlightenment project uh, which was talked about by the british and these kind of comparisons which british made uh, they made so that they were able to in a way subjugate the people those who were the native people that was the idea uh, behind uh, such kind of comparisons which were made by the british and uh, what we tend to see in the 18th century that britain they tried to view themselves as an integral nation where english scots and welsh all of them uh, uh, they, they will be there and british has some kind of a community uh, will be separate from others and british Uh, they 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 will have those kind of traits which will separate them from others in the uh, context that they were more superior in nature and the others they were in a way inferior and uh, non civilized and the ideas of uh, despotism were also related to it uh, despotism when you tend to see is a kind of a governance in which legitimate royal power was nearly the same as that of a master over a slave and uh, Uh, the kind of way the way in which oriental states they were being organized british they tended to convey that it was some kind of an oriental uh, despotism and uh, the asian people they did not have any kind of laws and asian people were not governed by the laws so british they had to bring those kind of laws uh, for themselves uh, for these people and uh, the idea of despotism was given some kind of a new life uh, by the british writings and it was some sort of a way or the kind of a manner by which uh, they were contrasting the india's earlier history with the law and order that british conceived they were bringing so british they tried to communicate this idea that british they will bring such kind of laws such kind of ideas that these laws and these ideas will, will be beneficial for the indian society they will not communicate that british they will use these laws and these ideas for themselves for their own personal self uh, uh, self interest but on the other hand it was being communicated to the uh, general masses in india that whatever british they were doing in india was for the benefit of the indians and indians are going to benefit by the kind of changes which will be brought by the british in india and indians they were uh, in a way treated in such a manner in the racial policy that they were inferior and uh, their language their culture their traditions their ideas all of them they were inferior to the ideas which were promoted by the british and indians they were being ruled by the moguls and moguls they were considered to be the despots so thereafter this kind of a mogul despotism uh, could be seen in the context of india so these were the things with which uh, uh, in a way we will find that indians uh, they were uh, uh, they, they were seen and they wanted to reform india in this way and uh, what we find is edward said who has talked about uh, orientalism and he says that you can see on the screen as well edward said's uh, book orientalism which became very popular and he argues that orientalism was a knowledge which was thrust from above through the power of europeans so what said tried to communicate was that how europeans they were using orientalism as some sort of an ideology or as a technique uh, by which they were trying uh, to thrust the knowledge from the above and in a way this uh, knowledge will in a way improve the power of Uh, the europeans as we can see in the case of india and uh, other colonies where british they brought their own language their own customs their traditions and how these customs traditions traditions language uh, uh, their own ideas and when they will be in a way imbibed by uh, the masses uh, 
then uh, in the long run these muscles they will serve as carriers of the indian uh, carriers of the european culture and at the same time these muscles will also serve as uh, some sort of an apparatus at the lower administrative levels because they needed uh, english speaking indians so later we see during uh, the times uh, in the 19th century uh, we find that uh, macaulay's minute on education uh, tried to create this kind of a society where english was promoted as a language and on the other hand there are other historians like eugene schick and others and they have argued that it was produced through a process of dialogue in which the colonial officials indian commentators and native informants they participated in a collaborative intellectual exercise so uh, they were suggesting that all these people they were also associated in a way that uh, they were in a way in a dialogue uh, with the uh, europeans and how indian information was in a way translated in european languages uh, especially english so that uh, they could be taught to the europeans those who came to india in terms of administering india so when they will be more aware about the kind of uh, atmosphere uh, about the customs traditions and uh, the practices of india then they will be more Uh, 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 more successful in terms of their career as well as they will be able to uh, uh, rule india in a much better way in the interest of the british so these were the kind of uh, ideas by which uh, orientalism was also being used uh, by uh, the british uh, to their own advantage so east india company when we tend to see warren hastings who came as the governor and later became the governor general and how Uh, uh, when Warren Hastings he came to Bengal, uh, and thereafter, uh, what we find that how uh, he tried to apply these kind of principles of Orientalism, uh, where uh, the conquered people they were to be ruled by their own laws, and uh, British rule it had to legitimize itself in an Indian medium. So uh, this was the kind of idea. Uh, which was uh, which could be seen uh, during the times of uh, Warren Hastings and uh, Asiatic Society of Bengal was established during this time and other kind of initiatives with regard to uh, the oriental learning were also promoted during the warren hastings but uh, what we find that these kind of things uh, they later uh, shifted in another direction where uh, more focus was uh, on anglicization in in the context of uh, uh, these ideas Uh, uh, reverse acculturation is one idea which has been talked about by Gauri Vishwanathan, and uh, when uh, you tend to produce knowledge about the Indian society, so this knowledge which was being produced by, uh, by uh, from the Indian society, so that Indian society could be uh, used, uh, uh, Indian society could be ruled in a far better manner. So Gauri Vith- Vishwanathan has called this process or this idea uh, in the framework of uh, reverse acculturation, where Uh, you will find that uh, british they were uh, trying to learn indian practices cultures tra- uh, cultures traditions etc so that they can adapt themselves and in a way uh, better uh, in a way uh, better administer india what we also find that uh, it informed the european rulers of the kind of customs or the laws uh, which were there in the indian society and how the indian society could be uh, assimilated into uh, the kind of british practices which were there and that is why we find that the establishment of the fort williams uh, college at calcutta in 1800 where civil servants they could be trained in the various traditions and the cultures and how these civil servants they would use this kind of a knowledge for their own personal benefit and for the benefit of the east india company so what we find basically is that how uh, uh, orientalism was in a way rejected and if uh, but if the orientalist discourse was uh, initially premised on a respect for ancient indian traditions uh, it produced the knowledge and about uh, the kind of subject society which ultimately prepared ground for the rejection of orientalism uh, as a policy of governance so what we find that how this policy of orientalism was in a way used for their own personal benefit and if you uh, see the kind of uh, uh, ideas which were propagated by the british they talked about the kind of degeneration uh, which was happening in the indian society that how uh, the various scholars they highlighted the ancient glory of india and now how it emphasized as you can see on the screen as well that how it emphasized the subsequent 
degeneration of Aryan civilization and this legitimized the authoritarian rule as India needed to be rescued from the predicament of its own creation and elevated to a desired state of progress as achieved by Europe. So, uh, India was it was suggested that India was in a way going for some kind of a degeneration the Aryan civilization which was there uh, in the earlier times now it was uh, degenerating and how uh, Europeans they will help Indians uh, to achieve the earlier glory or progress uh, which they, they had achieved earlier. So, these kind of ideas they were being pro uh, propagated and as we talked earlier as well that how orientalist learning was pr promoted during the times of uh, Warren Hastings and uh, the first translation of Bhagavad uh, Gita by, by Charles Wilkins was also done during this time. And William Jones another scholar she established the linguistic connection between the various languages like Sanskrit, Greek and Latin and all of them they belonging to the Indo-European languages. So, all these kind of things they were being done during uh, these times and how connections between the Greek and Latin and English languages that was being done so as to uh, show that Indian civilization was different in nature and it was no in, in no way uh, inferior to uh, the civilization which was there in Europe. And in that context, uh, we find that how William Jones, he founded the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1784, uh, where a lot of focus was to be uh, given to the history, the civil and natural antiquities arts, sciences and literatures of Asia. We find that other institutions like Calcutta Madrasa and Sanskrit College in Bararas, they were also uh, founded so that they also promote study of Indian languages and scriptures. So, we find that such kind of institutions like Asiatic Society of Bengal, Calcutta Madrasa, Sanskrit College, all of them they were trying to promote Indian languages and uh, scriptures, they were trying to promote the kind of research uh, with regard to Indian uh, Indian scriptures, with regard to the literatures which were available in India. So, they were in a way recognizing that they were all the, all of them they were very important, but in the later times we find that such kind of a, uh, such kind of a thrust uh, went missing and uh, Britain or the British people those who were there in India, those who were associated with the East India Company they took a totally different turn. Uh, when you see uh, Convalis uh, when he came to India and thereafter he got engaged in the anglicization of the administration and he had a very low opinion about India Indian character, ability and integrity and he considered them to be corrupt and the higher post in the administration and army could not go to Indians. So, this is the kind of situation we see during the time of Convalis where he went for uh, more anglicization and he did not consider Indians to be honest in nature and uh, that is why the uh, posts in the army they could not go to higher posts in the army and, and in the administration did not go to the Indians. So, British they propagated these ideas they had these kind of preconceived notions that Indians were dishonest and these kind of ideas were also promoted that Indians were not uh, honest at all. But uh, if you see the situation then the kind of salaries which were given to the Indians were comparatively very paltry in comparison to the Europeans and Europeans they were paid very highly. So, this kind of a thing was not done with the Indians. Indians they were paid very low the way they were being treated by the Europeans uh, it was not also in the right spirit and the policy of racialism could be seen everywhere. And when uh, Convalis he tried to improve uh, the honesty of higher services because he was paying them very handsomely Europeans were paid very highly and this was now not happening uh, to the Indians. So, the ideas of prejudice the ideas of racialism could be so, uh, could be seen uh, in the uh, entire uh, in, uh, duration of the colonial rule and uh, some kind of steps which were taken by uh, the British uh, which we find that uh, various kinds of settlements like the permanent settlement for example, which was initiated by initiated by the British. Uh, Convalis was the one who introduced the permanent settlement and the main intention behind uh, the permanent settlement uh, was to secure more and more revenues uh, for the British 
and at the same time to create some kind of a property rights in the land. So, when British they wanted to create these kind of property rights earlier Indians they had these kind of notions with regard to their lands that uh, lands were not sellable lands could not be sold because they, they considered the, their land to be their own mother. But the various revenue settlements which were introduced by the British all these revenue settlements they made land to be some sort of a commodity and when land was made to be some sort of a commodity property rights they were being created in the land and when permanent settlement was introduced it was also introduced with the intention of stabilizing the government revenue that how the government revenue will also be stabilized over a period of time when a fixed revenue income will be given to the British and at the same time another important aspect was was with regard to the support which they got from the zamindars. Zamindars, uh, those who were uh, an important class uh, even during the Mughal times and British they used uh, this class uh, as uh, some sort of a class which will support them in any kind of problem which British will encounter in the future times. And this could be seen uh, during the revolt of 1857 when Zamindars they supported the British and uh, uh, British they reaped the benefit of supporting the Zamindars uh, via the permanent settlement in 1857 revolt. So, if you see the if you see the permanent settlement which was introduced how exploitative it was that the uh, they had to pay the land revenue at uh, a specified date and if they will not pay the land revenue at the specified date then the sunset laws they were being employed by the British and these sunset laws demanded that uh, the property would be auctioned, the zamindari would be auctioned by the British uh, at, at a point of time uh, when, uh, the, uh, when the land revenue will not be received at that point of time and some of the scholars like Beveridge uh, they believed that if uh, the uh, zamindars uh, by not accepting the settlement uh, uh, zamindars were ruined at once and by accepting the permanent settlement they were ruined after some interval. So, these were the kind of things happening uh, with regard to uh, the kind of uh, policies which were followed by the um, British in India. And when we tend to see the various uh, kinds of ide uh, ideological orientations uh, uh, which were uh, being uh, which were being used by uh, the British in the garb of ideology so to promote their own rule. We find that not only uh, orientalists in, in the framework of oriental uh, despotism that was being used uh, not only how Mughals they were being shown as uh, despotic rulers that how uh, Indians they were to be uh, exploited uh, they, they, they were being exploited by the Mughals and how high revenue demand was creating that kind of a situation for the Indians that that they could not sustain themselves. So, these were the kind of ideas they were, they were which were being used by the British uh, to promote their own rule. But when we tend to specify the kind of principles uh, which were there in the policy which was uh, followed by the British, then pragmatism was one policy which we find that how during the uh, Battle of Palasi, Battle of Buxar, how British they were they used all sorts of uh, treachery and deceit. Uh, how they became more pragmatic where they were ready to use uh, the treacherous methods uh, to remove uh, the Nawab Sirajuddaula and thereafter how Mir Jafar and Mir Qasim both of them they were being used by uh, the East India Company in terms of getting more and more money and more revenue for themselves. And at the same time we find that British they were being very greedy in that context and they were more political expedient in that sense that uh, political expediency was being used in terms of supporting certain rulers. Uh, this we see during the Carnatic wars as well where British supported certain rulers in the Battle of Palasi as well and at other places as well. And the main uh, interest of the British was economic in nature, how they were able to extract more and more revenue and money for themselves. And these ideas of racialism and the sense of superiority uh, were the bedrock on which all these ideas they were being based. So, in the uh, next uh, uh, discussion, we will further talk about uh, the uh, imperial ideologies which were being used by the British. Uh, in this discussion, I would like to end the discussion at this point of time. Thank you very much.